Hi, this is Art Wickens again. I'm here with another episode, and this charming episode this is, of The Art of Physics. This particular episode is a ticklish proposition. Two scientists I wanted to interview last season weren't available then. As you know, we've managed to wangle scientist protection program access through the minions, but the program only works for those who have departed, and today's two scientists are very much among the living. They are James Dewey Watson, who is 88, and J. Craig Venter, who will turn 70 this year. I suppose I might have persuaded that come to the studios to inter interview live, but... <laughs> yeah, I know, our ratings are not threatening Neil deGrasse Tyson's cosmos, but the minions are right on the ball and found a very interesting situation before anyone is accepted into the scientific protection program, they have to undergo a thorough interview process. The Minions found Watson and Venter in interview waiting rooms and managed to whisk them here for a brief talk with us. Let's start by welcoming James Dewey Watson. I have no idea what purpose this will serve, but I suppose it's better than waiting in the waiting room. The magazines are all out of date, you must be Professor Wiggins. Uh, indeed I am, but please call me Art. Ah, the informality of this modern age. I call myself Hon Honest Jim, but I suppose you might as well call me Jim. <laughs> okay. We've also invited <laughs> Professor J. Craig Venter to join us here. Welcome, Dr. Venter. Well, thanks, Art. Somehow you look vaguely familiar, and please call me Craig. We need to get on with this. I have lots to accomplish before any scientist protection baloney begins. I have no clue about why they scheduled my interview so early. Craig, I see you haven't changed a bit since I saw you last. Hurry, hurry, hurry. You bet I'm in a hurry, but at least I'm not so insensitive that I blurt out insulting comments during public hearings. Gentlemen, uh, uh, please, we're on public TV here, and some people might not understand what you're talking about. Please tell them a little about yourself before you proceed. I grew up in Chicago and went to college at the University of Chicago and Indiana University. I then went to London on a postdoctoral fellowship. In 1953, Francis Crick and I proposed the first accurate model of the DNA molecule. Along with Morris Wilkins, we received the Nobel Prize for our efforts in 1962. Subsequently, I taught at Harvard for 20 years, became director of the Cold Spring Harbor L Lab in New York, then eventually became head of the Human Genome Project, which set out to map the entire DNA of humans. Wow. The start of my education was postponed by the disturbing conflict in Vietnam. I was drafted, but then I enlisted and served as a corpsman in the field hospital. When I got back home, I felt the need to do something worthwhile, so I earned degrees in biochemistry, physiology, and pharmacology. My initial research efforts were directed at brain chemistry, but I was hampered by the slow progress in identifying the DNA of a particular protein molecule. To speed things up, my grant allowed me to obtain a recently invented automated DNA sequencing machine and helped work out the new machine's bugs. It worked so well, I got more machines and suddenly found myself at the forefront of genome sequencing research. Yes, but at the time of that public hearing you referred to earlier, you were just a biochemist with one small lab. I was responsible for the entire project. Yeah, 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 you were uh, the big cheese and I was a small crumb, but I had found a way to speed up the sequencing process, which would have improved your project. But did you go along with me? No. In a July 1991 hearing before a committee of the U.S. Senate, you shouted, not just said, you shouted that you were horrified because virtually any monkey could use my methods. Uh, maybe I was a little loud, but I was making a point. Really? Craig, don't be so hard-headed. It wasn't about you. It had to do with patenting gene sequences. Well, that certainly wasn't any idea of mine. I knew that, Craig. We both worked for the National Institutes of Health. My direct boss was the head of the NIH, Bernadine Healy. Luckily for you, you were several levels down. I had to deal with her ridiculous policies firsthand. 
President Bush, 41, installed her as head of the NIH in 91. But I had a run-in with her as far back as 1985 when she was deputy director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. The genetic regulation she put in place was so awful that before I even knew her, I said, the person in charge of that biology is either a woman or unimportant. They had to put a woman someplace. Wow, you really put things right out there, don't you? <laughs> if you're going to speak the truth, speak it loud and clear. Well, is that why you did what you did when you wrote about Rosalind Franklin and called her Rosie? Uh, wait just a moment here. Again, my viewers could get lost if we're not careful. Let me explain. In Jim Watson's 1968 book, The Double Helix, he related his personal view of the discovery of DNA structure. He did call Rosalind Franklin Rosie, and he spoke negatively about her looks and personality. Since the key photograph in the DNA analysis was due to Franklin and she wasn't appropriately credited, Watson has been criticized. Yes, and it's not all fair. I can take a lot of criticism, but I have to pass along some credit to Morris Wilkins, who had to work with Rosie directly. I didn't know her very well, and perhaps Rosie's negative attitude seems to have rubbed off on me. But your book talked about other women you pursued in England. You called them popsies. You might have a problem with women, huh, Jim? I suppose you might think I was scarred for life when Ruthie Duskin knocked me off the quiz kids in 1942. Whoa. I won $100 and bought a pair of binoculars so I could watch birds with my father. I'll tell you though that my Harvard teaching had a wonderful benefit. By age 39, I married a 19-year-old sophomore from Radcliffe. She's been a wonderful wife and she's even younger than you, Craig. <laughs> well, maybe your problem is more with authority. I can relate to that. I'm certainly not delighted to work for somebody else. Me neither. I had my troubles at Harvard. Department heads, colleagues, committees, administrators, endless droning meetings. My colleague Edward O. Wilson called me the most unpleasant human being I had ever met. I believe he meant I wasn't willing to put up with the academic baloney, so I considered a, it a compliment. But Craig, you didn't stay much longer than I did at the NIH, did you? Nope. You resigned in April of 1992. I lasted until July. Wallace Steinberg, inventor of the Reach toothbrush, put up $70 million, and we formed the Institute for Geno Genomic Research, TIGER. We managed to sequence several small organisms' genomes, but the big goal, the human genome, was still beyond our reach. By this time, Francis Collins, a medical geneticist from the University of Michigan, had replaced me as head of the Human Genome Project. At the project's halfway point, less than 3% of the genome was sequenced, and the costs had ballooned way over budget. Well, everybody knew this. So our team increased our efforts with new techniques and a new sequencing machine that was eight times faster. We formed a new company, Solera, with the motto, Speed Matters, Discovery Can't Wait. The race to sequence the human genome was on. I must confess, Craig, I'm glad the baton had been passed to Francis Collins. That was a big, tough race, and I know what kind of competitor you are. I was happy to go back to cancer research at the Cold Springs Harbor Lab. It did get a bit hot. Some began calling me Darth Venter. <laughs> if you had still been in the game, I shudder to think what you might have called me. <laughs> Please, uh, let's get back to the human genome. Uh, the uh, rival groups uh, made such a commotion, word got all the way to the White House. President Clinton told his science advisor, Neil Lane, to fix it. Make those guys work together. The job fell to Ari Petrinos, the Demar Department of Energy's genome director. Good old Ari. He invited me to his place for pizza and beer. I knew he had called Francis Collins too, but I came anyway. Ari was very persuasive, and he didn't threaten us like he might have. Francis and I agreed to work together 
even before the pizza was gone. Yes, and as they say, the rest is history. Here's a photo of the two of you with President Clinton at the May 2000 announcement of the rough draft genome sequence. Clinton said, we are here to celebrate the completion of the first survey of the entire human genome. Without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. Certainly a very proud moment, but just the start of many more races to come as the DNA contributions to cancer and various other diseases are explored. And for that matter, what about the genomes of various other forms of life? Didn't someone point out that we humans share about half the genes of the banana? <laughs> oh yeah, well, we went on to sequence the genomes of many other organisms studied by the biologists. For example, in 2003, we released the genome of the dog. Dogs have more genes in common with humans than mice do. <laughs> I remember that well. The particular dog your team sequenced was your very own dog, Shadow. There's a picture of it for you. When you spoke in Michigan several years later, I met you after the lecture. And I showed you a picture of my dog, Pepper, <laughs> whose genes are more than 99% similar to the sequence you published. How do you like that? Enough about you guys and your animals. You know I had my personal genome sequence recently. Craig, you and I are among a rare group who have had this done. Of course, but it's very expensive. Back then, it cost about $2 million to sequence your genome, but the cost is dwindling. It will get to the $1,000 level soon, and many people will have it done. You know that the variation from one human to another is usually way less than 1%. And that brings me to a point, Jim. What was all that flap several years ago when you made some kind of racist statements? You know, people are way more similar than we are different, yet you said, in, and I quote, inherently gloomy about the prospect of Africa because our social policies are based on the fact that the their intelligence is the same as ours, whereas all testing says not really. That was just me shooting off my mouth again. I'm like the old American sportscaster Howard Cosell. Tell it like it is. Mm, that's more like tell it like you think it is. Don't you have any filter for what comes out of your mouth? Filter? What filter? You're talking to Honest Jim here. Uh, I think we're about done here. Uh, thanks. Wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm not done with Honest Jim. What about your selling of the uh, Nobel Prize medal in 2014? No living Nobel laureate has ever, ever done that before. Do I detect some jealousy here? I suppose not everyone wins Nobel Prizes, do they? Well, if you must know, I had it auctioned off because Francis Crick's family did the same thing with his Nobel Medal a year earlier. All that racist controversy a while back cost me a lot of salary as I was forced out of the Cold Springs Harbor Lab. People were ignoring me and I didn't like that. Uh, that's not all the press reported. You said, <clears throat> wanted a Hockney. That's the modern artist David Hockney. Again. That's Honest Jim shouting off my mouth. Actually, I already own several Hockneys, but none of them are oils. Besides, we don't have any wall space at home anyway. I could have donated it to the Cold Springs lab. Did you ever see a Hockney? Here's oh. one. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose appreciating artworks is a good hobby, but maybe you should take up something more active, like sailing. I've got this boat, the Sorcerer. Here are some sailing action. Maybe if Honest Jim spent more time on the water, he'd have less time to shoot off his mouth to the press. How about going out on my boat with me when we get out of here? Well, to be honest... Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I think we better get you back to your waiting rooms before you really need the Scientist Protection Program. <sighs> How in the world do I ever... Get these guys out of here, will ya? Until next time, I'm Art Wiggins. How do we do this anyway?